Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining me today. I'm Brian Sedlaskis, the 2020 recipient of the Joint ASIH and AES Meritorious Teaching Award in Ichthyology. And I'm honored and excited to be able to demonstrate and discuss some of the approaches to teaching that I've developed at Oregon State University over the last decade, as I present to you my talk entitled Virtual Specimens and Imaginary Fishes, Ichthyological Education in a Transforming World. Since 2009, I've taught two linked classes on fish biology annually. Ichthyology is the more popular and heavily enrolled of the two, and it surveys the evolution, diversity, function, physiology, sensory biology, reproduction, life history, and conservation of the world's fishes using a lecture and discussion format. Systematics of Fishes is primarily an active learning laboratory class and focuses heavily on phylogenetics, fish identification, and taxonomy. It also includes a substantial dose of fish morphology taught via the comparative method. Over the last decade, I've developed asynchronous online versions of both classes, which came in handy when I needed to pivot to teach the face-to-face -face versions of the classes remotely and synchronously during the COVID-19 pandemic. Even without the influence of the pandemic, the online eCampus versions of these courses have dominated enrollments in recent years. Here, you're seeing the number of undergraduate credit hours my Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Sciences has delivered annually since 2009. These trend lines begin at near parity, but while the face-to-face -face enrollment has remained more or less constant throughout the decade, the online enrollment has exploded. We now deliver instruction to more than three times as many students in online modalities as we do face-to-face and more than half of our students enroll fully online. Unless they choose to visit for commencement, these students will never set foot on the physical campus that will become their alma mater. And these trends hold across almost our entire university, driven by the substantial resources and effort that OSU and its faculty have been pouring into online education. You can see some of this, these statistics here on this page. We teach students from all over the country and world offer more than a thousand classes created by more than 700 faculty and a team of instructional designers and enroll an expanding online student body that skews heavily towards non-traditional age individuals. The mean is 32 years of age. Oregon State is currently ranked number four in the country in online education and has maintained a similar ranking for the last 10 years. So who are these students and why are they electing to study online? In a nutshell, most have some aspects of their lives or professions that prevents them from relocating to Corvallis, Oregon. Some are working fisheries professionals, others are active duty military on deployment. Many are partnered to people with jobs far from campus, and many parent children enrolled in school districts throughout Oregon. We also see a fair number of students enrolled at other universities that have jettisoned their programs in natural history and even students physically located in Corvallis that prefer to study online. In these cases, there's usually something else occupying their daytime hours, such as a job, caregiving to small children, or collegiate athletics. The faces at the physical campus are shifting as well, though perhaps not so extremely as the online population. As this chart shows, the undergraduate student body is growing older with the mean around 23 and more than a quarter over 25 and thus considered to be of non-traditional age. That means that more and more students are combining studies with other significant time commitments, such as working a substantial job or raising children. The student body is also growing more diverse in terms of representation to people from backgrounds traditionally underrepresented in the sciences though we still have a huge amount of work to do in this area. While the figures that I'm showing here are specific to OSU, I suspect that many of you will find resonance here, particularly if you teach at a large public university. And the final shift that I want to highlight is technological, not demographic. Quite simply, our students are now completely digital natives and have lived essentially all their lives with near instantaneous access to the kind of raw factual information that students of my generation were taught to look up in an encyclopedia or textbook, or that we dutifully copied into our notes during traditional lecture courses. In the last two decades, information has become cheap, ubiquitous, and surprisingly accurate. 
For example, here are the results from a short experiment that I performed without getting out of my chair while I was writing this talk. Working through my voice commands, my cell phone, which is a far more powerful computer than any I used as an undergraduate, was able to tell me the scientific name of the world's smallest fish, pulled a precise, a precise statistic for the number of valid fish species currently known to science, locate an accurate and surprisingly detailed explanation for how countercurrent exchange works, and provide a correct diagnosis to separate goldfish, Carassius, from carp, Cyprinus. A typed query to Google got around serious difficulty in recognizing spoken scientific names and found a passable dichotomous key to Oncorhynchus and an associated lesson plan. Faced with that success, one might ask whether we even still need courses in theologies. If students already have free and instant access to the world's knowledge about biodiversity, what's the point of covering that material in a class? The answer, of course, is that simple retention to facts forms the lowest tier of cognition in any academic discipline, as commonly and famously summarized in Bloom's taxonomy of knowledge. Access to all the knowledge in the world offers little utility unless one knows what to do with that information. Do students understand connections between facts and concepts, and can they explain them to others? Can they apply what they have learned in new contexts, such as by inferring the ecology or systematic placement of an organism that they haven't seen before? Can they select and synthesize knowledge to produce something creative and original? These are the skills that demonstrate mastery of a, of a subject. And importantly, they also represent the kind of skills that lead to success in future professions. At least so far, the top two tiers have defied automation. Computers excel at remembering, and in some contexts and with human guidance, they can understand, apply, and analyze information. Evaluation and creation remain the province of human ingenuity and brilliance. Therefore, the more competent our students become at working with knowledge at the highest tiers of the pyramid, the more likely they are to find fulfilling positions and future success. As instructors in the Jimmy community, we're therefore faced with two global challenges as we move deeper into the 21st century. The first is to ask how we can deliver effective instruction in ichthyology and herpetology to a student body that has become more diverse, older, scattered across the globe, and increasingly overcommitted. Strategies that worked in the past may not always find maximum efficiency or efficacy in the new educational landscape. Second, in the face of ubiquitous access to information, we need to investigate how we can emphasize the higher tiers of understanding in our course design and instruction. As these two images hint, I'm going to argue throughout this talk that virtualization offers an effective solution to the first challenge and that shifts to more frequent and active engagement can address the second. More specifically, these are my top five tips. Virtualize to enhance inclusivity, challenge students to apply knowledge regularly, design and scaffold assignments that facilitate creation, provide opportunities for students to choose how to show what they've learned, and move at least some exams to open note formats. So let's start with the first of these, virtualize to enhance inclusivity. In setting up my argumentation here, let me return to this pair of slides. First, I want to remind you about the high demand for online versions of courses and how an increasingly large slice of our student body cannot physically travel to a brick and mortar campus, or if they can, aren't close to a university with the resources that students at a flagship school enjoy. For these students, online access is the only access and the impact of virtualization is obvious. But I also want to remind you about the changing face of the student body in the face-to-face -face classroom. These students are often a few, a few years older than they used to be and are often juggling family responsibilities. With a decline in state and federal support for public education, tuition rates are rising and so are housing costs. Many students are therefore working 20 or more hours a week at a job to help make ends meet and some are commuting to campus from a substantial distance to find affordable housing. The diversification of demographics means that more of our students are first generation scholars and more are working and learning in a second language. All of these factors can affect student success differentially, sometimes in unexpected ways. For example, since long before I was hired to teach it, 
OSU's Systematic Sufficient class has offered open access to a collection of study specimens with which students can practice outside of scheduled class hours. Success on the practical exams has correlated very strongly with the time spent studying the specimens. That study strategy works very well for students living on campus with open hours in their daytime schedule, but not at all for students who commute an hour to attend classes, who balance a daytime job with a full course load, or who need to pick up children from daycare at five o'clock. Thus, we found that an option intended to help student success and enhance learning was actually creating a barrier to inclusivity because not all students enjoyed equal access. We realized that we could achieve more equity among the face-to-face -face student body and open access to an entirely new online demographic through virtualization, essentially bringing the digitized versions of the specimens to students since the students could not always come to the specimens. As we outlined in a paper published earlier this year in Ichthyology and Herpetology, we created a custom database that links specimen images to metadata about ecology, identification, and so forth. Here, you are seeing the entry page for the database and a cartoon of its architecture at right. As you dig into the database, you'll find that each taxon, including species and higher levels, has its own metadata page and images from at least one specimen. The students access this information during complete guided weekly lab assignments. Uh, and this virtual teaching collection sits at the heart of the online version of the Systematics of Fishes course. Students on the face-to-face -face campus also enjoy full access. And so now they can study an ever-growing set of specimens whenever and wherever it works for them. Populating a database like this was obviously a lot of work and more than I could have handled alone. So we recruited, and I'd like to thank, a team of undergraduate students that helped produce the needed images following Mark Sabay's immersion tank photography protocol. And then we image edited the photographs in Photoshop. Here are some slides showing what I hope you'll agree are satisfying results. Now, these aren't quite as good as having the physical specimen in front of you. And in particular, it's hard to manipulate the specimen to check the teeth, gill rakers, and so forth, but they get most of the job done particularly for tasks like examining body shape, coloration, meristics, and so forth. Now, in some cases, we've included more than one view of a specimen, such as with this um, spiny lump sucker, in which you need a ventral view to see the diagnostic fused pelvic fins. Multiple views come at a cost in time and efficiency, though. For the same amount of work, we could have just photographed another specimen. We've also found that some information about body shape does get lost in translation to a series of 2D images, and that the presence of multiple views of a specimen can provide a substantial and perhaps unintentional clue to the student seeking to identify them. So we in investigated whether there were a way to bring 3D imaging techniques to the course. And the answer to that is a resounding yes. These two animations demonstrate the great success that we've enjoyed uh, using a structured light scanner called an Artex Spider. The user passes a device which looks rather like a steam iron all around the specimen and constructs a fully 3D digital model. We've been using the site Sketchfab to host our scans because that site automatically generates code that will allow us to embed the models in websites or course management software suites like Blackboard and Canvas. Several other labs have followed our lead on this, and I'd give a particular shout out to Jessica Arbor, who has uploaded a lot of high quality open access models, some of which I've built into my course. So if you're looking to jumpstart something similar with your own instruction, I encourage you to use and contribute to the growing community collection on Sketchfab. Now, uh, labeled 3D models like this one prepared by Thaddeus Fuser have also been incredibly useful in teaching fish anatomy and osteology. So these allow online students to perform some of the manipulation that I would normally have students perform with cleared and stained specimens face-to-face. -face. 
The digital, digital models really help students to learn to evaluate the presence, absence, or morphology of important skeletal elements, such as preopericular spines, the Weberian apparatus, the kinethmoid, or pharyngeal dentition. Thanks in large part to Adam Summers's Scan All Fishes project, the website Morphosource has become a gold mine of open access CT scans that can be adapted for classroom use free of charge. The advantage of virtualization also laps over into other aspects of course design as well. For example, a piece of simple technology called a lightboard, shown here, allows the instructor to record a lecture and draw in multiple colors while facing the camera. The approach merges the advantages of chalkboard presentation, such as encouraging the students to copy diagrams into their own notes and forcing the instructor to slow down with an enhanced sense of connection to the instructor, and crucially, the ability to let students replay the lecture at will from home. The ability to re-watch lectures benefits all students and can offer particular inclusivity for students working in English as a second language. So here is an example of how I use the Lightboard to teach students about the structure of the Telios skull which has traditionally been one of the most challenging sections of the ichthyology course. Rather than just walking through all of this on a chalkboard during valuable class time, where I would have to face away from the class, or during a PowerPoint lecture, I can instead assign the lightboard lecture to be viewed from home. That opens classroom time for an inclusive activity where students identify and color the major components of the salmon skull. And that brings me to the next in my series of recommendations, which is to challenge students to apply their knowledge regularly, particularly if you want them to move beyond the cycle of cramming facts into their heads for regurgitation on exams. Students learn to apply their knowledge through active engagement with course material and not in lectures. This is something that I think the ologies have long understood and appreciated and which is why our courses often incorporate experiential learning opportunities like field trips and laboratories. So to some degree, I'm telling you something here that you likely already know and are likely already doing in your own instruction. So this is good and we should keep doing it. But that said, it isn't always clear how to implement active learning activities online. And some activities like field trips don't always have clear digital analogs. We have, however, had great success with using the virtual specimen collection to translate comparative laboratory assignments to the online environment. These exercises focus heavily on the fourth tier of Bloom's taxonomy, which is analysis, and they challenge students to examine, differentiate, compare, and contrast specimens to discover how to identify members of different taxa. For example, one of the worksheet questions challenges students to use uh, these images from the virtual collection to understand how they can use mouth morphology to differentiate various cypretiform species native to Oregon. And here are some examples of what fully online students have produced in response to these challenge questions, with the first panel here drawn from the images similar to those I showed on the previous slide, and the second comparing two local species of skates in Bering Raja. I hope you'll agree that these compare favorably to the quality and accuracy that we would expect from students working directly from the physical specimens. Here are a few examples from two more online students with the left image addressing the always tricky topic of juvenile salmon identification and the right pointing out differences in the operculs and nares among Pomacentridae, Pomacanthidae and Ketodontidae. In short, Online students can learn actively to discover and apply knowledge when given the proper support and resources. Now, the examples that I just showed offer some strategies for how to let students practice applying knowledge at the middle tiers of Bloom's taxonomy. But what about the highest one, creation? My take home here is that students really can create some amazing things during a 10 week course but it takes careful design, scaffolding, and frequent feedback to smooth that process. To get students to think at this level, 
I've designed a quarter long create a fish assignment that accounts for about a quarter of the total points available in my ichthyology course. The prompt challenges students to create an amazing fish that does not exist, but plausibly could and describe its anatomy, ecology, and life history. This assignment has a lot of strengths. It forces students to integrate material from across every major section of the course. It reinforces how each piece of an animal's biology helps to adapt it to its ecological niche. And it sidesteps many plagiarism concerns by requiring each and every student to invent something new. It also offers students substantial freedom to draw upon their personal skill sets. For example, a student in a past year created this statue as part of her final submission, putting the art into science that transforms STEM into STEAM. For students to succeed at such an open-ended assignment, they need to progress in stages and to receive personalized feedback at least a few times throughout the term. The first stage of the process involves submission of a brief concept statement with grading focused on effort and creativity, not on biological accuracy. Timely feedback from the instructor here helps to point students towards taxa, publications, or biological phenomena that they might research further over the coming weeks and provides an early warning system when a student starts to head into biologically implausible territory. Sometimes they literally jump the shark. Intermediate stages focus on completion of a draft, a peer review, an optional review from the Campus Writing Center, and final submission with the inclusion of an illustration or sketch of the invented animal. Final grading emphasizes creativity, plausibility, and thoroughness. Student response to this assignment has been tremendous, and they have invented some wonderful fishes and written papers that demonstrate admirable learning. Some memorable submissions include the genie sculpin, in which males compete for access to the most palatial plastic bottles as nesting sites, a chemosynthetic eel pout, a luring lungfish, which is accompanied by the gorgeous watercolor at lower left, venomous snipefishes, and a bioluminescent archerfish that lures fireflies by matching their signals, and many more. One submission won our library's top award for undergraduate research and writing in the sciences. If you're interested in trying out the assignment in your own class, I would be happy to provide the documentation and grading rubrics upon request. Create a fish is a large capstone assignment, but it is possible to work creativity into smaller tasks as well. Here's an example that my recent graduate student Thaddeus Buser developed in which he challenged students and me to create dichotomous keys to a set of fishes in the poetic form of their choice and to perform it in a poetry slam for a handful of extra credit points. The students had a blast and so did I. And they also cemented their understanding of how a dichotomous key works by constructing their own. Thaddeus's assignment bridges well into my next recommendation, which is to offer students some opportunities to choose how to show you what they've learned. These opportunities help to ease anxiety, prompt students to feel like they have agency in building their success, and provide feedback on which parts of the course students find most memorable or valuable. For example, on my exams, I usually include some version of this prompt. Write a question that I didn't ask, but you wish I had, and answer it in the form of a drawing or poem. Last year, one student rose amply to the challenge by penning this impressive takeoff on Blake's famous poem, The Tiger, to explain how some members of Cyprinodontidae survive annual droughts. Pupfish, pupfish buried tight in the desert of the night. They seem immortal eggs that lie beneath the sun and earth so dry. Before their lives come to an end, each pupfish looks to find a friend. Though sun this pool may yearly dry, eggs left in earth can still survive. And when the clouds return each year and fill this home up with their tears, from eggs new life comes to be. Did what that made hagfish make thee? Pupfish, pupfish buried tight in the desert of the night, with odds against their hopes to thrive, still these fish dare to survive. Brava. Or if you prefer haiku, consider this reflection on the exceptionally brainy elephant nose fishes of Africa, 
which feature prominently in my units on neuroanatomy and electroreception. Who has the big brains? Osteoglossomorpha. Still, fish brains are small. The artwork option has produced some compelling results as well, as shown here. From left to right, we have visual explanations of how artifices learn socially from each other, how the stargazer has modified its eye musculature into an electric weapon, and how metamorphosis represents the second critical period in the life history of marine fish larvae. And finally, I really do recognize that exams hold an important place in our assessment strategies and that we do need to know whether students have mastered specific concepts and skills before passing them on to future courses and future careers. My major recommendation with exams is to do away at least partially with the traditional closed book format. Such exams prompt students to channel their effort into the lowest tier of Bloom's taxonomy, remembering, which is often followed swiftly by forgetting. In the age of Google, this is the least important of any of the tiers. So in my laboratory practicals, I've done away entirely with the closed book and I allow students to refer to their notes and course materials. This eliminates the need for them to focus on memorizing the spelling of scientific names, allows them to use resources that they will employ in an actual field or laboratory investigation and opens the door to the inclusion of more questions that focus on knowledge application. For example, this set of questions from a recent practical confronted students with fish A, which they hadn't seen previously, and a series of questions designed to help them realize that despite looking like a gar, fish B, fish A lacks ganoid scales and possesses an adipose fin, meaning that it can't be a member of Lecososteidae. Students who have mastered this unit of the course will quickly realize that this combination of characteristics suggests a close relationship between fish A and C. Hi, Dilip. <laughs> it's the kitty. So uh, Nibblet realizes this too. <laughs> Students who have uh, mastered this unit of the course will quickly realize that this combination suggests not a close relationship between fish A and C, um, between fish A and C, not fishes A and B, and indeed both A and C are members of Carassiformis. Open note exams have their place in non-laboratory courses as well, for at least some portion of the assessment. For example, this question uh, from one of my ichthyology exams emphasizes analysis and application by asking students to compare and contrast the probable locomotory styles of the fishes represented by a pair of 3D models and to hypothesize about their ecology. The question provides a much better test of whether students have understood fundamental concepts in fish locomotion and hydrodynamics than would a multiple choice question focused on a fish that they have already studied. And the response is essentially non googleable because the question doesn't tell the students which fishes these actually are. The instructor can also swap out fishes from year to year, making it tough for students to plagiarize answers given in previous years. In effect, Questions like these force students to think and respond at higher levels of cognition. So to recap my major messages, as 21st century teachers of the ologies, we are facing at least two major challenges in delivering effective instruction. One is the need to adapt our techniques to serve an ever broadening and far flung student body. And the other is the need to help students build cognitive skills at levels of sophistication that cannot be easily replaced with queries to Siri and Google. While I lay no claim to have all the answers, I have found some that have worked well over the last decade. Virtualization provides a remarkably effective means to build inclusivity, particularly so when used to enhance face-to-face -face instruction. I also recommend that teachers challenge their students regularly to apply knowledge rather than repeat knowledge, and that they include at least one well-scaffolded well assignment in a course that prepares and promotes and prompts students to exercise their creativity and choose how to show what they have learned. Lastly, while exams will always hold importance as a component of a holistic assessment strategy, we can, we can help students to focus more on higher levels of cognition and less on rote memorization by inviting them to use their notes and course resources when it comes time to demonstrate their mastery. With that, I'll thank the numerous people who have helped me with course design, instruction, and ichthyological inspiration over the years. 
offer gratitude to my colleagues in the Oregon State University Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Sciences and OSU's eCampus for their financial and logistical support of the course development that I presented here. Thanks to everyone who tuned in today. Thanks to Niblet for helping with the last section of this recording and best wishes to you all.